Romans, I'm sorry, Romans, Matthew chapter 18, we were Romans last week, Matthew chapter 18, we're going to be looking at verses 1 through 5 this morning, and we just finished our series on bodybuilding for the church, and we're all much stronger because of it, um, our, more importantly, our church hopefully is, more, is stronger because of it. And what we meant by bodybuilding for the church is the things that God does for us and through us to strengthen us to be more like Jesus, to represent him in what we, how we act, how we live, and in what we do in ministry. The interesting thing, if you've ever watched bodybuilders, is you always see them uh, used to see them anyway. I don't know if it's so much of a thing anymore. Everybody's a bodybuilder now, I guess. But they they would have shows and they would flex their muscles and they would, you know, they'd flex their arm muscles and their neck muscles and their nose muscles and everything. You could see their muscles, every muscle everywhere, you know. But you never saw them do anything with those muscles. You never got to see them lift weights. In fact, when you see the people that actually lift weights, they look much different than those people. So you got to wonder, what's the disconnect there? Is it purposeful? And is there any point to building a body that you don't use to do any lifting with? I would dare say no, other than just to look good and impress other people. And I think the same is true for us as God's church. Our purpose in endeavoring, praying for him to help us and endeavoring on our part in his strength to build us up to what he wants us to be, how he wants us to be, to be his representative body here on earth, here in our part of King and Queen and in our state and in our nation and in the world. I believe that his purpose for that is not so that we can just look good and show off to other people and other churches. Would you agree with that? He's not just getting, he doesn't just want us to build ourselves up so that we can flex our spiritual muscles towards each other and those around us. He wants us to actually use those muscles. He wants us to actually use the body that he has built in his building here to do what we're going to call this morning and for the next couple of weeks, heavy lifting. And what I mean by heavy lifting is, thank goodness, not any actual heavy lifting because none of us are trying to throw our backs out this morning, but spiritual heavy lifting. And when I say heavy lifting, what I literally mean is doing the kind of thing for the glory of God that is challenging for you that you might not have a lot of motivation to do, that you might not feel like you have the skills to do, and that does not seem like it's going to bring you much glory or recognition. We're going to talk about the kind of heavy lifting that requires you to rely completely upon God and enables you to give glory to 100% to God. So when you think of heavy lifting, I don't think there's any more appropriate illustration of heavy lifting in the church than children's ministry. Children's ministry. Uh, For example, when I mention children's ministry, I bet that like 90% of us men in the in here just tuned out because they're like, oh, he's talking to somebody else now. He's talking to the, to the women and the uh, young women. It's not the case. He's talking to all of us. Now, it may be uh, more terrifying to us as men, more challenging. It might look like a much heavier lift. But the fact is, is that when we have something really heavy to lift, we don't use just a part of our body. What do we use? All of our body, legs, arms, back, everything. And God wants all of our body to be 
availed to him and available to him and useful to him in doing ministry to all kinds of people. And this morning, we're talking about children because Vacation Bible School is on the horizon. And we're moving fast towards it. So if you look at Matthew 18, verses 1 through 5, we're going to see Jesus talking about children's ministry in a couple of different ways. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 says this, At that time the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Then Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, Unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. I threw that verse 6 in there because it kind of wraps up the passage for us. So what I want to share with you this morning is God's perspective on children's ministry. And what I mean by children's ministry is ministry to children, that's for certain. But also ministry as God's children. What it should look like for you and I and us together to be doing ministry as children of God and to others who God would make his children and who already are. So what we're going to do is see two of these ways this morning. The first one is this. These are ways for each one of you and all of us together to be involved in children's ministry. The first is this that Jesus points out here. Be humble like a child. Be humble like a child. Jesus said it this way. Well, I'll start verse 1 and give you the background. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Apparently, as you look through the Gospels and you look through the passage just previous to this, this was an ongoing topic of conversation for the disciples. Who was going to be top dog in heaven? Which one of them, in, in fact, is what they were saying. Who is going to be the most recognized? Who's going to have the biggest crown? Who's going to be the, um, the one that they look at and say, he was really the premier servant of God? And that conversation continued with them, and it continues now amongst Christians and churches and so on and so forth maybe not quite as boldly as the disciples were because they were um, not, they didn't know all that, that we know now about humility in the kingdom of God. But they are about to get a really sharp lesson in it. So they're walking along and the book of Mark tells us that Jesus actually turned to them and said, what was that you guys were talking about? Who was, you know, because he knew that they were talking about who was going to be number one or number two, number three, what the order, the pecking order was going to be. And so it says the disciples, that's where we come to verse one in Matthew. It says the disciples say to him, who, well, we're, what we're talking about was, uh, <clears throat> you know, which one of us is your favorite? Which one of us is the best? Which one of us is going to get the most recognition uh, in heaven? Maybe even down here, Jesus. So Jesus does, as only Jesus can do, the, the perfect thing. Verse 2, it says, Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. There's a lot of ways that we might interpret that, but I'm going to give you a couple of really I think important ones and the most salient ones from that passage this morning. We're going to answer this question to begin with. Why would we consider a child humble? Why did Jesus consider that child the example, the illustration of 
humility. It was because, more than likely, they weren't just children like, you know, 10, 11 year olds, they were, they were little ones, um, toddlers, maybe even infants. And he set them in the midst of them and said, be humble like this. Little children, babies, toddlers, what have you in particular, are humble in this sense. They need everything from the one who, their parent or the one who provides for them. And they offer nothing to the parent or the one who provides for them. Let me just give you um, some examples that you know already. If you have a child, a small child in your home, do they feed you or do you feed them? You feed them, right? If you don't, they let you know about it. Um, Do you pay for their stuff or do they pay for your stuff? You pay for their stuff and you will be paying for it for a long time. It's okay though. It's worth it. Do they um, protect you or do you protect them? You protect them. They really can't do anything without you. Now, they they think they can because they have that nature in them very young and um uh, i i you know hate to tell this story on my on my own daughter but now that she, cause especially now that she's you know 16 years past this happening but when when she was one and she could talk pretty well at that point and um hasn't really stopped but it's a, it's okay when she was one her mama was putting diapers in the diaper holder on the hanging on the end of the diaper table and the changing table. And I heard them in there having this conversation and she put them all in there. And as fast as she was putting them in there, Marion was taking them out and throwing them aside. And, and she said, because she wanted to do it. And Lisa said, you need to stop. Mommy is in control. She held her hand and said, Mommy is in control. And she looked right at Lisa and said, No, Mama, I'm a troll. <laughs> so on, in one sense, she was right. She was being a little troll-like. But uh, she, what, was, what she was trying to communicate, though, was she was in control. Little did she know that apart from us, um, she had nothing. She would have had nothing. She needed us for everything. And as far as provision and protection and what those, the the ability to stay, sustain life goes, there's nothing that she could offer us, nothing that children can do that. And I believe what Jesus was saying there using that illustration was this, that's the same relationship that we have with God. There is nothing we can do for him and we need him to do everything for us you see there's nothing that we could offer to provide for God he offers everything to provide for us let me give you a couple examples of that first of all there's nothing that you and I can do or provide ourselves to make us right with God There's nothing that you or I can do to save ourselves. There's nothing in us that has the ability to even know or recognize or love or worship or submit to or follow God like we're supposed to in and of ourselves, just on our own. Scripture says it this way in Psalm 53. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt and have done abominable iniquity. There is none who does good. God looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. Every one of them has turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good, no, not one. And then Romans 3, and it's a lengthy passage, so I'm just going to hit some highlights from it. Romans chapter 3, 
the Apostle Paul spells out to the, the Roman Christians that their, our salvation does not come from ourselves. It comes completely through faith in Jesus. In verse 11 of Romans chapter 3, God's word starts off this way, much like actually quoting Psalm 53 that we just read. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Therefore, in other words, so that's our state. That's, that's how we are. And then he goes on to say, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. In other words, there's nothing we can do. Not, we can't practice the Old Testament law well enough. We can't practice what um, the world tells us is right enough. We can't practice what our parents or our teacher or our preacher or anybody else has done enough to be right with God. But we can put our faith in him and believe that Jesus Christ alone came to earth, lived on this earth a perfect life, and died on the cross for all the ways in which we have failed God and rose again so that we could be his children and depend upon him. So there's... Well, let me read a couple more verses to you to, to, just to affirm that. God's verse is this, again in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and in him alone. So we have everything that we need to depend upon God, before, or depending upon God for, for our salvation. And there is everything that we need to depend upon God for after our salvation as well. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 or 13, God's word says this. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. I've always told me, I don't know that I have a, a, a life verse, but if I did, it'd be that one, Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. We need him for everything in order for us to be saved, and we need him for everything we do after we are saved. That is the definition of humility. That's what it means for us to be humble like a child and as his children. Our dependence is never ending. In fact, it ought to be increasing the longer that we know him. When we do otherwise, or when we try to do otherwise, is when we get ourselves in trouble. It's when our pride creeps in, when our selfishness creeps in, when our self-exaltation creeps in, when we want to be known like those disciples as better than the person next to us or better than somebody somewhere so that we can boast in that and in ourselves rather than in Jesus. And when we do like that, I remember reading one time a uh, uh, pastor that written he said we're basically like uh, paraplegics those who are paralyzed from the neck down who are completely bedridden and depend upon everybody else for our care provision and protection but when we hear that somebody important is coming to our home we, in our mind, try to will ourselves to, be, to get up and to do things and to look good and to prepare and be recognized. And I would dare say that illustration has always stuck with me, and I, I want to take it a step further this morning. If you can imagine that we were, again, in that position of being paraplegics, dependent upon others for all of our needs and protection. And... We saw on television that there was an upcoming weightlifting competition. 
And we knew that some of our friends were going to take part in that, some people that we knew. We saw the people on there. They looked really strong, and they were getting a lot of cheers and recognition and cameras on them. So we thought to ourselves, I've got to do that. I've got to, by my own will and strength, take part in that weightlifting competition. There's only one problem. On your own, you can't. You would not be able to. So spiritually speaking, we can't take part in the heavy lifting that God wants us to do. Whether it's children's ministry or whatever other challenging and difficult and um, maybe at this point unappealing task. It's got to be a matter of us humbling ourselves before him and saying, God, apart from you, I am nothing. Because that's what Jesus said about us. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And of course, you can take the transver- the converse of that and, and simply say, with him, I can do what? Anything. Anything that he calls me to. So we need to be humble as children of God. And we need to be humble towards children of God. Or humble towards children. I'm going to specify two different kinds. First of all, I'm talking about children who are children physically, physically aged as children. And the reason that we need to be humble towards them or in regards to them is that they are often at their, in their young lives ripe for the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's a lot of reasons for that, but I believe that there has been a focus on children's ministry in the last hundred years or so because people realized that they didn't have as much going working against them as oftentimes we do as adults in our belief in Jesus Christ. And that they understood very clearly that these truths about hell and heaven and all these things, they could more concretely understand, or they were more real to them than they are to us because we are so, it takes a lot to impress us anymore, doesn't it? It takes a lot to impress us. But kids, it's right there for them, right there. One time I heard a, Minister saying, you all remember the old song, bear with me as I even tell you the title, but there's an old rock song called Hell is for Children. And I was listening to one of my favorite pastors one time preach about it. He said, he said you know that song, Hell is for Children? And, I, and I'm sitting in the car listening, I'm like, do you know that song? I can't believe you know that song. And he said, well, you know what? He said, that song is exactly right. He said, and his point was that children hear about heaven and they hear about hell and it's real to them adults hear about it and they're like eh I got a new car they hear when they hear about heaven that's I'm more impressed by that or they hear about hell and they're like well you know um I survived Afghanistan or Iraq or Vietnam what have you I it's you know I'm not really scared of that but kids are like and we should be too we should be too, but our the the point here is that Jesus is wanting us to realize the important opportunity, the unique opportunity that we have in ministering to children. Um, in Mark chapter nine, which is a, um, a parallel recording of this passage Jesus um, d- this is the the narrative it says Jesus sat down called the 12 and said to them if anyone desires to be first he should be last of all and servant to all then he t- then he took a little child and set them in the midst of them and when he had taken him in his arms he said to them whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me and whoever receives me receives not me but him 
who sent me. There's a lot tied up in that statement. Again, the scene is this. The disciples are fussed about which one of them is going to be the greatest. They're acting like children, but in, uh, um, not, not in the way that Jesus instructs them to. They're bickering like children instead of humbling themselves like children. And so Jesus' response to them is, whoever wants to be first has to be last. In other words, whoever wants to be, in fact, he says it this way, whoever wants to be first shall be the last of all and servant of all. So if you really want to be humble in the way that Jesus is wanting you to be humble, which I hope that there's at least a spark of you that wants that and God will ignite the fire from there. If that's the case, then what it means is that you don't get to be praised by everybody. You get to serve everybody. And that's so neat when it comes to children. Because as adults, we become accustomed to receiving recognition from other uh, adults. We, we, you know, we vote for people. We vote for who's going to get a certain award. We award one another. We commend one another. We thank one another. We do those things, and they're good. It's good that we do that. It's not necessarily as good when we do things expecting that or we do things because we want to get that praise. And a real helpful measure of that is how much you're willing to humble yourself towards children. Because children do not hand out awards. Children do not get petitions signed to um, have your name put on a plaque or a statue somewhere. Children don't get you gift cards. Their parents do that and give them to you, and then the child gives it to you, and they feel like they've done something. But you know where that gift card came from, don't you, parents? Children just need, and they need, and they need, and they need. They are the most receptive bodies of service that there is. And we need to be the most productive body of service that there is towards them. It's a matter of us recognizing that whether it's VBS or whatever opportunity we have to serve those who are an incredible need, more need than they recognize, not just the needs that we see on the surface, um, their physical, sp emotional needs, but their spiritual needs as well, their need for Jesus. There's not a lot of glory in that. These children aren't going to come, and, and they're not going to come on their own. They're going to need somebody to, to bring them, so we minister to parents as well. They're not going to come and and tell us what a great job we're doing. They're not going to come and increase our offering. They're not going to come and, and be, um, you know, serving in whatever capacity we need them to. They're not going to be teaching Sunday school. They're going to need what we have, not give what we need. And instead of seeing that and being like, ah, I just don't know if it's worth it, I want you to see that, those opportunities, and say, it's worth everything I've got. There's a fellow who's kind of a, a Christian hero of mine. His name is Dwight Moody. He was a evangelist and uh, Christian leader at the end of the 19th century, and I believe into the early part of the 20th. And um, Moody Bible Institute in Chicago is named after him. Um, and he was effective here and in Europe for the glory of God. And he had a heart for children. And he, he told the story one day of walking to church. And if just quickly, a quick hist history lesson about, our, about the church 
Sunday school began in England as schooling for children who otherwise were not getting any because it would happen during the Industrial Revolution when children were sent to work in the factories day and night and Sunday was the only day that they were off and so they started Sunday schools to teach them everything um, and certainly about Jesus. So he's on the way to Sunday school one day and he sees this kid standing on the, on the street, this little, you know, urchin, and he says, what are you doing? And he, the guy knew who he was and that he was the Sunday school guy, so he took off running and, and I would not advise this in today's world or really any time, but he took off running and chased this kid into his little tenement house. The kid crawls under the bed. He catches him by the leg before he gets all the way under there, drags him out, throws him over his shoulder and hauls him to Sunday school. He tells a story on himself, and then he tells another story that um, at one point somebody confronted him about his work with evangelizing children. And he said, Mr. Moody, I really don't like the way you're, that you are um, bringing these children to Christ. And he said, okay, well, what, what's your way then? And he said, well, I don't really have a way. I just don't like your way. He said, well, I like my way of bringing them to Jesus better than your way of not bringing them to Jesus. And his point again was, do whatever you can. Do whatever God enables you to. Believe that whatever he calls you to, he is going to make you able to do it, to reach these children for Christ. There's another side to Jesus' story, uh, Jesus's statement about how we approach children. And he's not just talking about physical children. He's talking about spiritual children. And again, it's a matter of humility, and I'm just going to touch on it, on it briefly in regards to how we treat each other. Our interaction with each other gives us the opportunity to experience and glorify Jesus uh, like no other. And Matt, again, in Matthew 18, where we started, Jesus says it this way. Whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who are who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. So the point that Jesus is making there and the point that we've seen throughout these passages where we've talked about building up the body, some of the main themes of that body building is humility and unity, love for one another, speaking the truth in love to one another. And that's so necessary for us because we can't, <coughs> excuse me, we cannot reflect the person of Jesus Christ unless we are loving one another like Christ loves us. We cannot minister to children in order to bring them to Christ if we are not acting like Christ's children to begin with. In fact, or in, in other words, we must be treating each other as Christ's children in order to bring more children to Christ. And Jesus says there's no room for pride in that. You can either be haughty and push other people down and away from Jesus, or you can be humble and you can lift them up to him. I'm certain you know which one of those by now, by the end of this message, we ought to be. So I simply want to invite you to do this this morning. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Scripture says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. It also says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt you. He will lift you up in due time. 
This morning, if you would humble yourself before the Lord and say, I can't know you, I can't be right with you, Lord, except by trusting in your salvation. I can't do life as a Christian, Lord God, except by depending upon your strength and grace and provision through it. I need those things, Lord God, and I humble myself before you because I recognize my need for those things. And then if you would say, Lord, I I recognize that in order for me to be uh, your child, I need to be humble towards your children. Please help what I do to be about you and not about impressing them. And finally, Lord, I want to humble myself before you and be an instrument of drawing young lives, young hearts to Jesus and into his kingdom. Please use me in that way through prayer, preparation, participation this week and any opportunity that I have in any way that I can be of help. Will you pray with me and ask God to humble our hearts in that way? Lord Jesus, we thank you that the the joy of your heart and literally the joy of our hearts is when we are humbly dependent upon you for everything. That's not easy for us because we are so self-assured and self-reliant and we have so many things, other things that we rely upon that we forget that you are our all in all and that apart from you we can do nothing. So we pray that you would help us to humble ourselves before you for everything, for our salvation, for those here that may not be sure that they have it, that they would be sure this morning because they humble themselves and say, only through you, Jesus, can I be forgiven and made a child of God. I pray for those here this morning that that know that they are children of God, that you would help us to humble ourselves before you and before one another, being willing to do whatever heavy lifting you point us to, not for our glory, but for yours, and that we would serve one another in doing so, humble ourselves before one another and serve one another so that we can be a body that's able to do heavy lifting, hard ministry, effective and fruitful ministry for your name and your glory and your kingdom by the strength of God that rests within us. Thank you, Lord God. Bless us, I pray, to humble ourselves before you, to minister as children of God, and to minister to children in the name of God. In your precious name we ask this, Jesus. Amen. Um, If you would stand, we're going to...